Good evening, everyone. From Chicago, this is CB3 Live on Today's Markets. I'm your host, Charles Brown, Portfolio Manager with CB3 Financial Group, and this is Episode 8. We are so glad you've chosen to be with all of us tonight. And I say with all of us because it's not just me. It's a community of people that have decided they want to be positive on what's happening in the markets and in this post COVID-19 world. So while we're waiting for everybody to uh, log in, I'm going to put the first poll up here. I start with this question every time. What's your greatest anxiety? Is it cabin fever, uh, loss of income or market uh, loss, opening too soon, that's a new answer, or another issue? And while you're thinking about that, I want to just remind you that adversity is inevitable, but misery is a choice. In inevitable is adversity, I'm saying it a different way, and misery is a choice. We here at CB3 Live have decided we are not going to be miserable. We're going to look at the data objectively, and we're going to find the positive in that. If you found us, and this is your first time here, and we're growing by quite a few uh, people every week, this is episode eight, as I said earlier, uh, if you found this and you're looking for uh, more doomsday <laughs> news about what's going on with COVID-19 and the markets, this is not the place to be. I've been doing this for more than 30 years, and I am determined to take a positive view on what's happening and to bring that view to you and keep you encouraged on what's happening in the markets. So today's theme is America gets back to work, and there's actually some controversy with that. Um, we got a couple surveys here. What have we got so far? We got 40% with cabin fever, 20% too concerned about opening too soon, and 33% other issue. Okay, got it, got it, got it. I was reminded by one of my clients that, uh, in their opinion, core portfolio holdings now uh, are toilet paper and sterilization wipes. That's kind of crazy, but that's uh, a core portfolio holding now, at least until the supplies get caught up. Another client said to me, you know, it seems like this is a good time to book a Hawaiian trip. There's nobody there. There's nobody on the planes. The hotels are cheap. The meals are super cheap. I think I'm going to buy the one today. <laughs> so where have you heard that all in one sentence? But that's where we are. So here's where we are on the results for the poll. 38% cabin fever, 25% loss of market, 13% uh, opening too soon, and 25% other issues. So not sure what that is, but uh, maybe you'll tell us sometime, okay? So I think, what do we got? Another couple minutes here, guys. What we generally do here is let people log on. Um, I'll take your questions. Hey, Andre from New York. Good to see you, buddy. Um, I take your questions as I get to them. We have four sections here that we cover, and I stop at the end of each section, see if there are any questions out there, and then you can always send them to me um, during the week. So my email address is cb3 at cb3.com, and if those of you that have been watching this for some time are aware that uh, I use slides and presentation materials, and I send those out tomorrow. So if you're not on our list and you want to be, shoot me an email, cb3 at cb3.com, We'll add you to the mailing list. We will not spam you or try to sell you something. Uh, I'm not a broker. I am a registered investment advisor, but I'm not a broker. I don't sell stuff. Uh, but our advice uh, is something that we're offering here on Thursday night, not only to our clients, but to those of you that have heard about us through friends or the Internet. And uh, that's, our, that's our purpose. So um, we've shown the results here. So what I want to do now is – move on i think we've got um we got julie on hey julie how are you larry and connie good to see you guys thanks for being here so tonight's agenda corona america is the first the u.s economy is second cb3 investments third and new trade ideas fourth now i'm gonna spend a little more time on our stocks this time I've, it's only eight episodes into this so we're still trying to look for a balance so I'll ask you at the end, um, you know, if the balance is working for you. We were expecting a peak in cases uh, in the coronavirus around April 10th. It ends up it was April 17th with 2,584 deaths in the USA. So the peak was a week later, but we're definitely on the decline as far as number of cases and deaths. New York reported a fifth day, a fifth day of declining deaths 
although hospitalizations rose slightly. But uh, Andrew Cuomo is still shutting down the state. New Jersey governor right next door, Phil Murphy, said he'll reopen parks and golf courses this weekend. Now, I find that interesting. They're both blue states. So here's the second poll question for you guys. When we open, wherever we is, and we do have listeners from all four time zones, I will eat at my fave restaurant, go to a movie or concert, still avoid big crowds, or making a hair point, a haircut or a stylist visit. Well, that's going to be on my list for sure. When we open, I will eat at my favorite restaurant, go to a movie or concert, avoid big crowds, or make a haircut, stylist visit. What do you guys think? I bet this is going to be pretty balanced. Yeah, or, or the haircuts are going to win. <laughs> so... All right, we're still taking answers here. I'm seeing uh, any questions. While we put polls out, if you have a question for me, just type it in the box, and I'll, uh, I'll look at it and uh, get back to you right away if I can, or I'll do it in between sections, as I mentioned earlier. All right, I think we got more than 50%, more than 50% makeup visit to the haircut or stylist, and uh, I'm with you on that for sure. All right. Some states have listed, lifted, I should say, lifted their restrictions, but did people go out? Well, the data from Georgia, Oklahoma, and South Carolina came out and said that people were coming out in trickles, not in droves. And again, you'll see these charts tomorrow when I send you the slides. But it's interesting to me that everybody's anxious, and yet they trickle out. They timidly go out. I got a slide here from a, a customer, a client in uh, Michigan, a picture of the World Theater. And the sign on the World Theater marquee says, the world is temporarily closed. And it occurred to me that if James Bond were the governor of Michigan, he would say, well, the world is not enough to close. We're going to close everything in Michigan. And, of course, that's the dichotomy that we're facing here, and it's going to be covered here in this section. There is now a worldwide, in my opinion, juxtaposition between the lockdown pundits most of those on the left and the media, and the Freedom First pundits, most of those conservatives. It's my prediction that if you just give it a couple weeks here, by May 15th, every state in the union is going to open in some way or another, including New York. And that's because it's going to be done on a county-by-county -county basis. Everyone knows that COVID-19 is going to be in the rearview mirror, at least in the spring edition, fairly soon. All right. Next poll question. I got a lot of them tonight because I want to get your input. I will feel safe in public. When? Well, now let's go by mid-May, by early June, by mid-June or later. I'll feel safe in public now. Let's go by mid-May, by early June, mid-June or later. Let me know what you think about that. Okay. And while you're doing that, I'm going to tell you about a friend. Again, I have people during the week giving me a good input here. And he said, look, I came up with this analogy, and I think it works pretty well. In a stereotypical war zone, the military leader, who in this case is Trump, or think General MacArthur, makes the final decision on the best strategy to win the battle. Whatever the decision, they're going to be lives lost. The chaplain, and that's the role of Fauci right now, will suggest that the plan be different to save more lives with a higher probability of losing the battle and maybe even losing the war, but at least we save lives. The general, MacArthur, or in this case, Trump, will usually counter saying winning the war at all costs matters more. That was General MacArthur's position in the Pacific, and I believe that that's going to ultimately be President Trump's position because I have done the research since the last week's show there is no instance in human history where we have totally shut down the world economy, totally shut it down, except for essential services. For any reason, for a pandemic, for a war, for natural disasters, for anything. What do we got here on results? Now let's go, 33%. Uh, Mid-May, nobody. Okay, early June, 44%. Mid-June or later. This is looking like early June. Okay, so that's about six weeks, five, six weeks away. Uh, very good. There are the results, guys. So I thought that analogy from my friend was pretty good. 
Um, for those of us that live in Illinois, and I realize we're in four time zones, so just hang with us here. Um, our governor uh, says we rank fourth in America as far as coronavirus cases. Well, we're sixth in population, so that's kind of a, a strange math thing. We're reporting 50,000 cases and 2,200 deaths. And for this reason, he wants to leave the state open through May 31st, but was faced with a lawsuit from one of our state representatives and a judge sided with the representative. So that's now in the court system as to what we're going to do here in Illinois. So who knows if we're going to go to restaurants or haircuts or what. Hope you guys, wherever you live, get to enjoy it. We're still trying to figure out what's going to happen here. Now, on the West Coast, it's a very different situation. You've got a Democrat governor uh, in California who's facing pressure and flat-out defiance from his people. Why? Because over the weekend in Orange County, 40,000 people, maybe you've seen it on the news, flocked to the beaches despite Governor Newsom's social distancing restrictions. So now he closed the beaches. So we have this fight going on between, no other way to say it, guys, blue state governors and people that are saying, enough already. We want to get out. So you're going to see more of this over the next three to four to five, six weeks. States such as Georgia and Texas are beginning to ease restrictions as well. But it's just not uniform across the country. The map that I have now, it's slide 14 that you'll want to reference tomorrow, shows the states which are reopening in part. Uh, many of these are, are red states, but not all. Uh, we got Montana, Minnesota, Colorado, Oklahoma, Georgia. And Georgia is a Republican governor who got thrashed by President Trump. I was astounded at that. I'm kind of wondering if it was just for show, candidly. But nonetheless, he did it. Um, South Carolina, Alaska, and then a lot of big blue states that are not going to be opening anytime soon, shut down or restricted until further notice. But check out this map when you get the slides tomorrow. Good evening, Nelly. You can come to Georgia and get a haircut. Yeah, that's true. Um, Nelly's in uh, Atlanta. So, um, yeah, although they, everybody's got their masks on in Atlanta. I wonder how they do beard trimming. I don't know. Um, the good news is, and this is, this is an update from really two episodes ago, episode six, although I covered some of it last week. The race for a vaccine is moving faster than I think anyone expected. Pfizer is joining other groups. Um, testing, doing all kinds of research, and expecting to announce an experimental, remember it's not FDA approved, vaccine in the U.S. as early as next week. Gilead, I reported last week, had announced that they were working on a strategy and that it had bombed just six hours before my broadcast last week. Well, now um, Dr. Fauci's jumped on their bandwagon and says he's pretty excited about the results that he's seeing. Johnson & Johnson is teaming up with Avejo, I think I got that right, um, for a home testing. So we got multiple threads of this going. We got a vaccination, we've got in-home testing because, see, this is not like AIDS, folks, where if you are tested negative for AIDS and you don't do risk-averse uh, behaviors, you're not going to get AIDS. But you could be tested for COVID-19 on a Monday go down and, uh, you know, walk across the street, run into somebody or, you know, a, a foot away from them, they sneeze, and all of a sudden, two days later, you have it. So an inexpensive test that we're going to be able to take even once a week is something that's really important. So I like seeing this from Johnson & Johnson. In addition to Johnson, Gilead, Pfizer, the Lancet Science Foundation in California states there are, check it out, 72 different therapeutics going on right now and 211 trials. I'm reading it from the screen. You can check their site to verify that. The race is on for a cure, folks, and that's super encouraging to me. And I think that's one of the reasons why the market is behaving the way it has. So here's the next uh, poll question. I'm going to give you a stat. Layoffs are not as pandemic as you are being told. Now, maybe that's by the media, maybe that's by your friends. This is a survey by LendingTree, who does lending to small businesses. 58% of businesses have had to have layoffs, but 42% have not. I was surprised by this. So I'm just curious when you hear this stat. Again, 58% of businesses had have, laid, have had layoffs, but that doesn't mean that 90% have. 42% have not had any layoffs. Are you surprised at this? I really would like your input. Did you think there were more? 
did you think there were less? I don't believe the data saying that no, 42% didn't have any layoffs. Well, you know, it's from Lending Tree. They don't have any real political agenda. So um, I think it's encouraging. I think it's encouraging. Anybody else want to uh, comment on this? We got a 50 50 split so far. But I'm seeing that the layoffs are just not nearly as pandemic uh, as they're saying. Um, why does all this matter? What I'm seeing, folks, and you're probably seeing it too, Republicans and Democrats experience this COVID-19 in very different realities, in large part because of where they live. Many conservatives live in states with fewer or no cases. Remember last week in Episode 7, I said 25% of all U.S. counties, 25, one out of four has zero cases in COVID-19. Now, that was as of last week. Maybe there's one or two this week, but it's still going to be small. Many liberals, especially in big cities like New York, like Detroit, like New Orleans, experience more death and consume far more ominous news coverage. And that's why we have this split. And so I'm making this bold prediction, and I'm laughing about the bold, COVID-19 is not just a medical story anymore. COVID-19 is going to be the biggest political divide in our nation's history because it is all-encompassing because it is the cause of the first in history complete shutdown of the U.S. and indeed worldwide economies. This virus ground to a halt what, hurricanes, tsunamis, world wars, pestilence, on and on and on, could not do. This virus has done it. And the restarting of the economy, I believe, is going to be a humongous political event. Let's see what we have here. 30% thought there would be more layoffs. 50% thought there'd be less. <laughs> one says, I don't believe the data, or 10%, I should say, and one, no opinion. Okay. That's cool, guys. All right, I'll take a break. I'm going to move on to U.S. economy. Let me make sure you got any questions here. I like the comment about the haircut. Even with home testing, people won't stay home. They won't self-test. You know, I hope you're wrong on that. You're probably correct, Onelli. Um, yeah. Hey, Mike, good to see you from out west. Good to see you, buddy. All right, any more questions that I'm missing here? All right, let's move on. So the U.S. economy, guys. We always start on the first slide with how the markets are as of today. The NASDAQ, the NASDAQ is down less than 1%. In fact, if we had kept the gains that we had overnight, the NASDAQ would actually have been positive for the year, positive for the year. The s and is down 10%, the Dow down 15, the Russell down 22. So here's the next question on the stock market. The stock market should be higher than it is. It's higher than I expected. Will drop big any day now, or frankly, I don't know. And it's okay if you click the last one, because candidly, I've been doing this more than 31 years, and I don't know from day to day what's going to happen in the market. All right, you guys answer this, and I'm going to keep moving forward. So yesterday's GDP, everybody's been waiting for GDP, gross domestic product, for the first quarter. And duh, it was down 4.8%. But it was quickly dismissed as old news. In fact, the market had a terrific day yesterday. Not so much today, but yesterday. Why? Because, again, that news has been factored in. I'm going to get to this more in just a little bit. Everybody knew it was going to be bad. All the doomsday sayers knew it was going to be bad. But as I've said, the market is forward-looking. The economy has to look back because it's looking at data that's already occurred. But the market looks forward because people want to be investing in what's hot, not today, but three, six, nine, 15, 18 months in the future. So I'm going to say this last line here three times on the next three slides. We remain in a secular bull market that I believe will last another decade. That's correct. We remain in a secular bull market that I believe will last another decade. So why am I so upbeat and so optimistic? Do I get paid to be this? No, I'm doing this because I believe it, because my research shows this. An expectation that the worst data is behind us is what contributed to the S&P's 
13.1% gain this month. Now, today was a down day, lost a percent, but 13.1% in a month, that's the best year since 19, pardon me, the best month since 1974. We remain in a secular bull market and will be for at least another decade. All right. How are we doing on the poll here? Market is higher than I expected. 75% will drop big any day now, 8%. Okay. Frankly, I don't know. You know what? I'm in that camp. It's okay. So, all right. There are the results, guys. Thanks for, uh, for offering that. So people ask me, you've heard me use the term secular versus cyclical. This is really important. So maybe put your pens down and really focus in on this. It's important to understand this. A cyclical market, forget it, bull or bear, doesn't matter. Cyclical is a cycle. That means boom, bust, boom, bust. A secular market is multiple boom, bust, boom, bust, boom, bust over a longer period of time. Secular bull markets last longer than secular bear markets. Let's look at this chart. This is chart 26 when you get your email tomorrow. We, the, the biggest uh, of the secular bear markets was from 1930 through uh, 38. Okay, actually 48, pardon me, type's real small. And then we broke out of that and we're in a secular bull market from 52 all the way to 68. That's 16 years. All right, and then we entered a secular bear market right around the time I got out of high school. No excuses. Can't blame me not getting a job on that. And that lasted 14 years. And then we had a huge secular bull market from 80 all the way to 2000, that's 20 years. Now within that secular bull market, we had cyclical bear markets. Think 1987 when the market dropped 20% in one day, but it kept going up. We dropped in 1991 when the US invaded Kuwait. That was a bear market, but again, because we were in a secular, secular is more powerful than cyclical. You with me on that? Secular longer is more powerful and cyclical. When we broke out in 2013, so the low of the market was March 9th, 2009, but we broke above the previous highs. It's easier to see this on the chart. In 2013, and it's my opinion, we could easily be in this, easily be in this until 2025, 2028. I just think that that's very doable. All right? If you hang with me on that, watch the chart when you get it tomorrow. I'm saying this slide a second time because a couple of people texted me back and said, yeah, that made sense. Folks asked me, as I said last week, why in the world, when the market is going up, is the economy going down? Or vice versa, when we get a bad piece of data like GDP dropped 4.8%, consumer sentiment dropped 22%, but the market is up. Because we don't trade the economy. We trade the market. And again, I don't mean to be flippant, guys. I really don't. We don't trade the economy, we trade the market. That's why it's called the stock market. It's not called the economy market. It's not called the news market. It's not called the earnings report market. Someone can brag to me about, yeah, our quarterback, you know, he had an 82% completion rate. And I'll go, that's great. Who won the Super Bowl? Well, we didn't. Okay, well, the stat that really counts is what the market is doing, and that's what we trade. That's what we trade, okay? Let me check my script. Hey, Jimmy, welcome from California. Hey, Charles Todd. Hey, Charles, that economy produces the best month for stock in decades. Yeah, I was just mentioning that. That gets a love. Anybody that's cheering this month of April, it's a great month. So, guys, I'm looking at another chart. This is number 28 when you get your email tomorrow. And I don't have a, I don't have a quiz for this. I wonder if I can ask a question. Um, you know what? I'm not going to try that because I'll probably blow it, but you'll see the chart on this tomorrow. So I'm looking at a chart that has industries on the left side and the workforce confidence index on the right side. So the overall confidence index is 29%. That's pretty bad. But at the top of that, public administration, teachers, again, it's a public service job, finance, what we're doing, 
construction, those are all 35, 36, you know, still not great numbers, but then you go down to the bottom, recreation and travel, media, entertainment, 12%. So if this news is accurate, and I think it is, it's from the LinkedIn workforce, so they did a survey of like 2,800 people and workers. Why is the market going up? Well, it's just what I said in the previous slide. The stock market is more confident of the overall workforce than the workers are. Why? Because the stock market is looking to invest capital, whereas workers are looking to put food on the table and sustain their lives and their family. It's very important, very important that you understand the difference. Participants in the market are looking for a way to increase their net worth. Presumably, they're already financially secure that they have discretionary income to do that. But workers, of course, are going to be more negative if their very livelihoods are threatened, as many have been in this epidemic. But we don't trade workers. We trade the market. And I'm really not trying to be insensitive, people. I'm not. I'm trying to make money for you. Those of you that are my clients know I have to look at this objectively like this. Those of you who are just trying to understand how all this works, the market is the leading indicator. Okay. U.S. economy. I'm looking at a really amazing chart. I just found this yesterday. This is by the Commerce Department, and it shows starting at zero the number of years that it took um, for an economic recovery to happen before it went back into a um, bear market or recession. And believe it or not, the one we just finished is the longest one in history. You might have known that if you've been watching earlier episodes, but it was the least amount of growth, even though it was 10 and a half years the least amount of growth. Many people have called it the most unloved expansion in the U.S. history, and the data plays that out. I'm looking at 61, 1961 and 1969 with a 52% gain. We didn't have that. The GDP gain was less than 30% this last 10 years, and I think largely it's because this last recovery, expansion if you will, was simply unloved. So it's almost better that it died and now we have a chance to really do something substantive because I think when people thought that this died, it was just going to go down to zero because it had gone on for so long. But what happened? Well, look in your 401ks. You'll see what happened. The buyers came in on March 23rd, and that changed everything. There are many of us out there and that, that I believe in this case we're going to see a V-shaped recovery. On camera, a V is like this. That doesn't mean an L and a U and all this other stuff. It means zoop, zoop, okay? I could be wrong. I hope I'm not. I could be. I think the equity markets bottomed on March 23rd. The Dow would have to trade to 18,200 for me to be wrong on this. A new bull market is underway, and the market making a V-shaped recovery, just pull up a chart of the S&P 500 anywhere. You can go and do it for free. And you're going to say, yeah, that kind of looks like a letter V. Which leads, the market or the economy? Quiz. The market leads. So if the market's making a V shape, is there at least a reasonable possibility that the economy could follow? In my opinion, there is. And I'm not alone in that. Trump says he, President Trump says he talked to Apple CEO Tim Cook. Now, this is the biggest company, depending on which day we check, in the world, trillion and a half dollar company. They have reopened all their stores in China. They did defer the launching of their 5G phones, but he's saying, yeah, we're gonna see a V-shape because the pent up demand that has been created by this horrible pandemic depressed some people, angered other people, and I know angered quite a few in governments around the world wondering, did we really need to do this, take what was the greatest economy in American history and totally shut it down? Folks, when I go out and drive on the Dan Ryan, sorry for those of you who aren't here, think big interstate, 16 lanes across. I have a cell phone. I have a backup cell phone. I have water. I have some energy bars. I got my GPS couple of them, and I'm prepared, but I still go out and drive on the Dan Ryan because I want to go somewhere. So do I just put caution to the wind and go out there? No, I'm prepared, but I'm not going to shut down my life out of fear. I'm not going to do it. 
Now, we've needed to do some of this to figure out what those preparations are, what the two cell phones and, and, the, and the energy bars and the water, the equivalent of being able to go out in public now, and that may change over time. But we've got to get going here. And Tim Cook says the same thing. Here's one of the struggles in this recovery. This is a blow-away chart. I can't wait for you guys to see this. 32. Half of U.S. workers who filed for unemployment, which now as of this morning, was still less than the last three weeks. But we're pushing 30 million people. There are only 340 citizens in the U.S., and I don't see too many one- and two-year-olds in unemployment lines. So the working population, it's a staggering number. But over half the people that have filed for unemployment earn more in unemployment than they did with their jobs. So that's a disincentivization to get people back to work. It's crazy, crazy. And again, nobody was prepared for this. They will be writing doctor's theses on COVID, how we were unprepared, what we had to do, and how to be prepared in the future. For the rest of my life, we're going to be talking about this. But when you've got a situation where you can't get people back to work because they're getting $600 more to stay home than they did working, that's crazy. It's crazy. You guys have to think that. I know you do. Economic studies show, this is from the Heritage Foundation, that higher unemployment benefits translate into higher levels of unemployment claims and longer durations of unemployment because people don't want to give up living off the lamb. All right? And that, unfortunately, becomes a society that wants to be dependent on big government. And that's not what I want, and I doubt it's what you want either. I'm checking earnings. Uh, this is big-time earnings season. We're going to talk about some of those in the next section. Um, but I'm still seeing, I think you remember, there's this chart from Reuters um, that I have every week. 65% are beating expectations. Normally, that's about 73. So we're, we're on the downside from where we normally are. And earnings, so... Uh, gross revenues and then uh, below the line, 63%, which is 5 or 6% lower than normal, but it's not catastrophic. Now, when we are doing these uh, results here in July, we're looking at the second quarter, I'm sure it's going to be much worse. But it's my belief, as I've said earlier tonight, and I want you to strongly consider, it's my belief that the market has already taken that into consideration. The market is rarely stunned, except with a virus, okay? Because most people trading weren't around 100 years ago when we had the last one, and that happened during World War I. And we still didn't shut down the economy. I'm sorry to get wound up here, folks, but this is just crazy. We managed to beat Germany, <laughs> and we didn't shut down the economy. All right, I'll stop. Okay, um... The bear market's over, guys. We're in a bull market. We're 30% off the bottom. Doesn't mean we're at new highs. We're not. Stocks often go up in earnings season. One that did not was Amazon today. I'm not the least bit concerned about Amazon, but Amazon dumped about 5% in the aftermarket simply because they couldn't make the deliveries that were being ordered. I don't know about you, but I had frustrations like click, 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 click. No, can't get it, can't get it, can't get it. And they give me a delivery date like May 20th. And this is back in March. And then once I place the order, it's like, yeah, we're going to bump that up to May 1st. And then you get another email. We're going to bump that to April 20th. So they didn't understand the demand. That's why they hired 150,000 new workers. Okay. I think March 23rd was the low of the market. I think the market participants knew that the panic was so bad that all the bad news was in and there were no more sellers. And that's why we've gone up since then. All right. I'm going to go on to investments here. Let me come back. Uh, what do you think is going to happen with oil? Um, good question. So my opinion on oil, first of all, if you follow the futures markets, oil delivers every month. So the, the May contract, which is over now, um, went negative. You actually had to pay people to take your oil. The June contract traded down to six bucks. It's now around 15, but the December contract is in the high 20s. And the reason for this ridiculous disparity is because there's no place to put it. If I have extra cotton swabs, if my wife and I order them at the same time and like, oops, we have 12,000 Q-tips. Well, we might just give them away or we might just put them in the closet. It's really tough to do that 
with a barrel of crude oil, especially when one contract is a thousand barrels. There's no place to put the oil. If you go back to episode seven, you will see that there are these barges out in the Pacific Ocean off um, Mexico in the um, Mediterranean Sea. It's crazy. Gulf of Mexico. That's just holding all this oil because there's no demand. There's nobody driving and there's nobody flying. So I think oil is going to be soft for some time. I think we're probably, if I were guessing, we're three years from seeing $40 oil, not $50, $40 oil. Good question. Thanks for asking. Please make us money. That will be my best. What is the C between definition of bull market and asking for a friend? Okay, so definition of bear and bull. So here we are. We have a stock. It trades up to $100 and stops, and it trades back down to 80 That's a bear market for that stock. It's never quite that simple, but, you know, 180 okay? Why? Because that's 20% down. Keeps going down, 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 all the way to 50. Now the stock rises from 50 to 60, and that's a bull market. You're saying, well, but the high was 100. It is. But when a stock or an index or a commodity, crude oil, gold, silver, whatever, they're all the same in this regard of bull and bear. If we've traded to 50 and we've made it to 60, that's a 20% gain. You're back in a bull market. You're not at lifetime highs. That's where we are. We're in a bull market with stocks, but we're clearly not above the February 19th high. Good question. That is the definition of a bull and bear market. Uh, Zoom got distorted this week. Will it rebound? Um, or is it me from Google, the new conference video? So I'm going to talk about Google, just, uh, um, Google and uh, Zoom in just a few moments. Thanks for asking, Jimmy. Cudlow predicts big snapback. Cudlow is the biggest optimist in the world. I love Larry Cudlow. And he just has a great demeanor. He just he's like, I just want to drink cocoa and put my slippers up and listen to him. Um, uh, he's an optimist. He gets paid to be an optimist. Uh, I like him. I think in general, uh, we're going to have a big snapback. I don't know if it's going to be a fast snapback. Okay. I do think it's going to be a big snapback. I think you're going to see GDP. Here's my prediction on tape. Except it's not tape. On video, you're probably going to see a 10% GDP gain in the fourth quarter. 10%. Now, will that be at all new highs? No, it's the same bull and bear situation. We've been beat down pretty badly. So thanks for that statement, Charles. ZM destroyed. Yeah, no, I don't buy it, Jimmy. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Best price for gas, 245 Yeah, it was cheaper here in the 170s. Also, where does one find a box of 6,000 cotton swabs? That was an example, Mike. Um, I, I just picture all these little Q-tip boxes coming in, like, you know, 190 of them on a, on a pallet, you know, so it's not one box. Uh, fair question. I'm going to give that a little laugh here. All right. Uh, 129 in Atlanta. Yeah, thanks, Nellie. And when will you pick up the airlines and cruise stocks? Not anytime soon. Just keep listening. Uh, no time soon. No time soon. Two, no, 209 to 220. You guys can talk to each other. This is great. Thanks for doing that. You know, we just tell each other where, where gas is. Um, so, uh, Delta, United, JetBlue, Southwest. Yeah, I'm just not looking at any of these. Cruise lines, Norwegian. Uh, I, I'm going to, I'm going to put a sad face on that. <laughs> Okay, so let me talk about what we've got going on here. So we bought Google this week. There's two classes of Google stock. Um, there's uh, A shares and C shares. We buy the A shares because you can vote. Not a real big deal, but G O G G L. So that's Google. Really, the company's called Alphabet, but everybody calls them Google. The ticker symbol, if you're if you're like taking notes during this section, is Golf Oscar Oscar Golf Lima. Um, the the revenues are really stronger, but the company's warning of a tale of two quarters. You know, it may not be this good going into the second quarter. I I think they're being conservative. I think Google's a great buy right now. Uh, they added on about eight and a half percent. We bought this just before earnings came out, so this was a good time one. Um, not all of ours are. You'll hear some of those in this call. Um, they think they're going to weather the slowdown. That's my opinion. Um, that they're pretty priced. Inelastic, so elastic means it you know flows, but inelastic means now the demand just stays right there. So we like Google, that went into CG. So here we are on Zoom. Um, first off, I bought Zoom too late. Um, 
if I have, uh, I got a lot of shortcomings, but one of them is uh, Johnny come lately. I mean, I just want to be shown, I guess I'm in an age and I've been seen burned on a bunch of IPOs that I just want to see. Uh, and, and these guys went, Zoom went from 10 million viewer, you know, users to like 200 million in less than two months. It's just staggering. Amazon, Apple, nobody's done anything like that. But they still have competitive advantages over their competitors. Um, the vast majority of their users are non-paying users. But if they come up with something that even gets them to pay $5, I mean, you think $5 isn't much. But $5 from you know, 100 million users, that's a bunch. Um, Zoom's previous daily record, as I just said, was, was 10 million in December of 19, and now they're seeing 300. They had a really nice bump Tuesday. They were down today because, again, these companies, as you, as you pointed out, uh, Jimmy, uh, you know, everybody's wanting to jump on this now. Uh, Zoom is a, a takeover target for sure, and we will more than likely hold on to Zoom unless they just totally dive bomb uh, for that reason alone. But the enterprise market is still their biggest opportunity, and they really haven't even touched it. The international uh, video conferencing market, uh, yeah, you know, they, they just got tons of up, up potential. So I'm holding them. We've been in them for now two weeks. I think I announced this in uh, episode five. Tesla. <laughs> Tesla. Why do I laugh? Because... Elon Musk, their CEO, at their on their call. So once they announced earnings, and again, we were in this just a couple days before this blew up to 12.12% on the upside. Another really blessed buy for the CG uh, account holders. But this is his comment. To say that they, meaning the government, uh, cannot leave their house, uh, pardon me, saying that they, people, Americans, cannot leave their house, they'll be arrested if they do, that is not a democracy. That is fascist. This is not freedom. Give people back their blankety-blank freedom. And I can't say what he said. But I will quote Mr. Spock from Star Trek. That was colloquially expressed, Elon, but essentially correct. And I side with him. I think we've got to get going. And the illustration that I just gave you about driving on the Dan Ryan 16 lanes wide, I go into it prepared. I know what the risks are and I'm willing to take them. Um, Tesla lost a billion dollars in cash flow last month, <laughs> in a month. But they still posted a profit, which shocked everybody. And the biggest risk to Tesla is that Elon Musk, and you're probably not going to hear this anywhere else, uses his Tesla stock to pledge against personal debt and personal debt would include SpaceX and his other projects and probably just his lavish lifestyle as well. So quite a few of his millions of shares are pledged against his holdings. But other than that, uh, Tesla is just a great stock. Um, they shrugged off. The, the investors shrugged off his outburst um, and, and basically are saying, look, we believe in you. We know that you are going to be what Amazon was. Everybody's going to be driving your car, just like everybody's going to be buying on Amazon. I was using Amazon in 1998. <laughs> That's right, 1998. And now you see where they are. Wish I'd bought them in 1998 and never sold them, but that's another story. Microsoft. Okay, so the reason I'm mentioning Microsoft is because it's been in our growth portfolio, but we actually added it into our income portfolio just this past week and did that just before their earnings report, which came out today and we got a nice little bump there. So why do I do this? Because some people will say, Charlie, um, you're managing our portfolios. I looked at my account and you only got like 3% or 4% or maybe five, but I really want to hold more than that for stocks that you're really convicted in. So my answer to that is, well, if we really have a high conviction in a stock, and those of you that are clients know this, those of you that aren't, might want to think about using this strategy for your own program. Don't put everything in one strategy. Have multiple strategies, but you can have some overlap of stocks. If you really have a high conviction, take a Microsoft. You're not going to put Tesla in an income portfolio, but you might put a Microsoft, which sports a, a really healthy dividend, um, and they just beat on their earnings. Fifth consecutive double-digit earnings per share beat. Fifteen consecutive beat on its report, you know, on, on what was expected. In other words, they, their beat rate. 
15 consecutive, you know, and you're paying a dividend, that's got to be in my income portfolio as well as my growth. So we did that, and um, we're looking at more stocks to do that, actually. So uh, Visa, this is another switcheroo. We actually had Visa and MasterCard in our growth portfolio. Visa did not behave quite as well, and I'm not totally sure why, although I suspect some of it is that Apple has a new MasterCard. I have one. I don't know if you do, but um, it's kind of cool. It's all electronic. They don't get statements from you, but it's all on your phone. And they, they clear through Goldman Sachs, but it's MasterCard, and they've got millions of people using this card. So MasterCard actually is more of a growth stock right now. Visa more of an income. So we pulled Visa out of our growth program, CG, and put it in our income program. And I like that move. So we've got exposure to both um, of these uh, companies just in different places, okay? Um, Vertex, so this is a cystic fibrosis play. We've had this for some time, um, really promising growth engine. There's not very many people specializing in cystic fibrosis. It's not like cancer or heart disease. Um, not really very expensive. Um, it's it's doable. It's like $250, which sounds expensive. But when you're looking at, at the other uh, high-tech pharmaceuticals that are much more expensive, that it's a reasonable stock. And we like it for um, probably at least through the summer. We, we just think it's uh, in a real good place here. Um, they did have a nice move in the pre-market. Um, we're not uh, as happy as we would like with our timing. I said earlier, one of my mistakes as a money manager is sometimes waiting a little too long, but, um, you know, basically it's been a good purchase. So we've got uh, various uh, analysts projecting this to go to 283, 293. And uh, if that happens piggybacked with the rise in the market, it should be pretty good. This is an interesting one. This is Pepsi. So I haven't owned Pepsi in a while because it's kind of a, a yawn of a company as is Coca-Cola, but Coca-Cola is huge. And I like to go with the biggest players in uh, their respective areas. But uh, Coke also has not done uh, too well during this recovery, probably because people aren't going out to restaurants and ordering Cokes. I mean, think about that, all those Cokes and canisters and fizz machines, and whatever, and millions of restaurants all over the world just not being used. So uh, the reason I like this is I I'm not seeing – much of an upside for Coke, whereas Pepsi has a broader uh, product line. You probably know that. So we swap out sometimes. We want to be in a space. In this case, it's consumables, consumer staples. Um, but we'll swap out a stock. So we sold Coke um, and we bought Pepsi. All right. That's what happened. I've still got my new trade ideas. I know we're running a little long, guys. I'm doing my best here. Let me handle questions. Okay, thanks. You got it, Jimmy. How about the cannabis market? You know, I'm not the guy to ask on that. I, um, I've got clients on here that do trade that in their own accounts, but I should tell you that no CB3 clients in my managed programs trade cannabis. I've got my reasons for that, which I'll answer in a private message if you want to hear that. Uh, everyone's using the free version of Zoom. Yeah, I just talked about that, Nelly. Um, not everyone. They're still making money, but a lot of people are. And the, the point of that is those are customers in waiting. And that happened with multiple markets like Evernote, you know, the note-taking software. It started out at $2 a month and is now $10 a month. So um, not everyone. Yeah, Andre, yeah, you're with me on that. So Charlie, like in video and semiconductors, love semiconductors. Um, it's funny. I, I know that uh, one of my uh, children is on the phone. He's a big NVIDIA fan. We've owned NVIDIA. It's just, oh, man, I, I can get the same amount of bang for less drama. Maybe it's my age. Um, if I can get a great return on a stock with, with just a little less drama than NVIDIA, uh, I'll do it. Uh, I like semis. We have on occasion bought the semiconductor ETF, which is like a package of 20 different stocks. Of course, if some stock has a real big breakout, you don't participate as much, but that's how we get exposure to the space. Thanks, Charles, for that question. That's the reason I read books. Yeah, people have asked me, so how do I come up with this? I read between 18 and 22 periodicals every week. Uh, you just got to do it. Just got to do it. Now, I love doing it. Uh, as you guys know, those of you who have been here for a while, I manage family money. We've got a, a big commitment. And so that's why I do it. 
but uh, my customers are the beneficiaries because they're trading the same thing that we are, not in the same accounts. Everybody gets their own accounts, not Bernie Madoff. But um, anyway, uh, daughter works at Juniper and just signed a huge enterprise contract with Zoom. That is great to know. That gets a love because we're long Zoom in CG. Uh, guys, I think Zoom is, is here. They were the first with the technology, and there's no way they're going to go from 10 million users a month to 300 and let anybody, including Zuckerberg, you know, including uh, the guys at Google, overtake them. You can bet they are working seven days a week to position themselves either to be that niche market that withstands the monster competitors, such as uh, a Target, such as a Kohl's, and I'm not saying they're the, we're looking at them right now, but there are still room for niche players among the giants. And in my opinion right now, I think Zoom is. So Motley said, NVIDIA, we bought 24, sure, okay. Yeah, I mean, good way to do your research there. I see some other people have commented too. Yeah, feel free to comment on other people's stuff. So running tad long, guys, I'm gonna get done here. Um, still looking at Netflix. I know, Johnny, come lately. We've been in Netflix many times. It just got more and more expensive, multiple too high. I'm waiting for a pullback. Um, their earnings report, they had a spike up. They've come back. Uh, if we continue to have some softness, uh, and I, I talk about the 20-day moving average. I'm a technical trader. If we can pull back there, I will be adding Netflix. I do not see that Disney is going to put them out of business, okay? In fact, Disney's off my radar now. They were on my radar, I think, in episodes four and six, but not right now. Gilead, I, I participate with Gilead in um, IBB, which is the biotech ETF. But obviously, if Gilead, you know, is up 20%, that's only going to be 3.5% uh, in the in the uh, ETF. But I just wanted to wait and see until we get a little more traction on who's going to win this battle. And it might be multiple solutions. You might find someone that has a vaccine that, uh, you know, is for people who've never had it, a vaccine for people who have had it before but recovered. I mean, I, I'm not enough a medical expert to know that, but... Um, Fauci said he really likes the trial data that he's seeing, so Gilead definitely on our uh, radar. Facebook, another one that we've owned. I mean, we pretty much own all the fangs but Facebook. Um, I, I just feel like we're, we're getting what we need from other places. Um, but Facebook, surprise to the upside. You know, I wish I'd been there. And so on a pullback, we are looking at them too. And we will drop somebody else that's not doing as well. A lot of people say, well, every time you buy something, you never talk about the ones you sell. Well, okay, I can do that. And there'll be actually a poll question here for that. But the reality is we're looking for stocks that are going to do well and going to do well for a long time. I don't want to be trading every week, but I'm not afraid to if a better idea comes along. There are 11 sectors in the S&P 500. We're only invested in six. That means five of them are doing nothing in our portfolios because of what we see in the market right now in this, this spike recovery. There are just some sectors that aren't responding, one of them being energy. Okay. Um, this is from a user last week. I'm not sure who, but LabCorp. Okay. Um, we're looking at that. Um, right now, they're, they're really erratic on their earnings. They don't have a dividend. It's well off its highs, and yet it's still expensive. So when it pulls back, it's got to really pull back for me to be interested in it. And candidly, there's just too many other stocks in the biotech space. But one of our users last week asked, this is LabCorp Holdings. Ticker symbol is Lima Hotel, if you want to check it out. I just remember I haven't been giving you all these ticker symbols. You guys know what Facebook is, right? FB, Gilead, G-I-L-D, Netflix, N-F-L-X. McDonald's versus Chipotle. So we hold Chipotle right now. We bought that, um, and, and it's done well for us. But you know what I'm seeing right now? And, and you, you saw this with the Pepsi and the Coke that I talked about earlier. What I'm thinking about this next week or so, McDonald's came out with their earnings and yet didn't do much. And yet I just think Chipotle, great delivery service. And we've been using it. But when you've got 90% of your business in a drive through and there's there's only like 15% of Chipotle's have drive through and not in our area, none of them do, none of them does that I know of. Um, I'm just seeing, I say 90, I'm seeing on the screen 95%. Um, most of their sales are through drive through We may be doing a swap, we wanna be in consumer food. Um, so who knows, next Thursday night, we may have dumped Chipotle and bought McDonald's or maybe just added McDonald's and uh, kept Chipotle for a while and dumped something else, we'll see. Um, from another user, what do we think of Quest Diagnostics, ticker symbol Delta, Golf, X-Ray? Um, 
expensive guys. They've really been hit hard based on the, the loss of uh, cancellation of their elective procedures. So DGX does well when people are going in and having colonoscopies, face surgeries, constructive, whatever, but something that they're doing out of their own pocket. And those have ground to a halt. And we're hearing here in Illinois, I don't know about your state, that those are still going to be uh, pretty quiet elective surgeries for at least several months to come. So that's a high PE, and it's just not something I'm looking at right now, but I like them down the road. So whoever it was, I think you guys, you're you online now here. And then the last one is Peloton. So Peloton is, um, because gyms are closed, this is an online interactive program. You pay 15 bucks a month, you put on the headphones, you get on your uh, you know, bicycle and you listen to them, the pep talk and you know, all that stuff. Um, I think this is where things are going. I work with my trainer and uh, you know, rather than just not working out. So we work uh, with a iPad and headset and I still have my music going in the background and it works for me. Um, you know, some people may not want to work with a specialized trainer and this sort of thing, which is virtual physical training. Um, we like it a little pricey and, um, that's why we'll, um, still keep our eye on it, but, uh, come back to it if it gets more reasonable. So I'm almost done. It's been almost an hour guys. I'm sorry. I hope it's not too long. I want to leave you with this. There is nothing new except for what's been forgotten. There is nothing new except what's been forgotten. And by the way, that means, well, the only reason it seems new to you is because you just forgot something. And I don't mean you, I mean me too. We've seen this before. It wasn't 2008, nine. People say, well, this isn't 2008, nine. You're right, it's not. It's 1987. And that's why portfolio managers that are 25 or 30 or even 40 don't have enough history to go back and realize, hey, I lived through this. I still see the look on my wife's face when she said, did you see this? Tom Brokaw said, the market crashed today. We're all going to be paupers. It wasn't that, but his tone of voice said that. We've been here, 1987, 33 years ago. All right? There's nothing new except what's been forgotten. COVID-19 is moving now from being defined as a global pandemic to becoming a worldwide political onslaught. You are going to see this battle of, no, we can't open. And yes, we have to open, or we're going to lose generations of growth, not just in the United States, but in multiple markets. And as I end every broadcast, my deeply held belief is that we will not only survive this pandemic, but we will thrive. And America, and indeed us, that are investing our hard in money, will be better off after this and wiser from what we've learned. As an older male, I'm excited because 71% of the deaths of COVID-19 have been men over 60, and I'm 65. So what's the takeaway for me on this? Well, we're going to clean up our sanitation. We're going to clean up our health care. We're probably going to have a safer society for older people, older men in my case, go out and be in society and have less risk of major disease like this. I don't know that, but I believe that. And until something counters it, I'm going to stay there. Guys, I got one last poll for you. One last poll. Did I cover too many stocks tonight? Or is this, um, is this something that's usable? Hi to Marianne. Glad you joined us. I don't know how long you've been with us, and I'm sorry if I missed you earlier. Let me handle questions while you guys are answering this, okay? Too many stocks tonight. I like hearing about CB3 stocks. Discuss even more. Eh, maybe just a little too many. I'm happy in my cash. <laughs> All right? Uh, Gilead is LabCorp. No, those are two separate companies, uh, separate ticker symbols. I can get back to you with a ticker symbol on that. Watch out. Facebook is listing as you diss them. Yeah, no kidding. Zuck is there getting ready probably to shut down my account. Yeah, that's going to get a funny. I shouldn't say like. I mean, let me, let me change that to a laugh. Under the Sun, ECC. Yep. Ecclesiastes, my favorite book. And the psychological downset is a result of tragic. Absolutely, Nelly. No question. Uh, that's our biggest risk. Our biggest risk is not the pandemic anymore, guys. We have a grip on this. We don't have a total grasp, 
but we have a grip on what this has done to America. And I don't think you'll ever see a response like this again in our lifetimes, and indeed maybe in 100 years. We will never shut down an entire world economy. They're never going to shut down the Dan Ryan for two months if there's an accident, and even if it has 50 cars in it, they're not going to do it. All right. 73%. I like to hear about CB3 stars. Well, that was pretty good. 9%. Discuss even more. Nine, maybe it's a little too many. I'm happy with my cash. Okay. Well, so I'll keep talking about what we own. And, uh, you know, I'll do the best I can. You guys got questions? CB3 at CB3.com. If you're listening and you're not on our list, shoot us an email. We're not going to spam you guys. I'm not looking to hassle you with anything. I don't sell anything, all right? But if you want the slides, I send them out Friday morning, and then I will be back here next Thursday night for episode nine. I make one more check here. Thank you, Jimmy. Appreciate those kind words. Thank you, Charles. Appreciate those kind words. Guys, we are at an hour, and I'm sorry for running long, but you're the best. And let me show you these results here before I, I lock down. Um, you got any comments you want to make about, hey, thank you, Andre. God bless you too, buddy. Um, shoot me an email. Tell me what you want. You know, and sometimes it's too fast to go, hey, Bob, how are you, buddy? What's going to be tomorrow? Uh, my buddy Bob here, he, he changed his homepage. He's always got a new picture of the Beatles. Uh, I'll make a request here. Can you put the long and winding road up there? That would make my day. That way I'll know you were listening. <laughs> All right, guys, thank you. You're an awesome audience. I'm here to help you any way I can. Shoot me an email. I'll see you next Thursday night. God bless you.